Okay, we're going to get started. Please take your seats. Okay, up next, we're going to have Pilar Eguez Guerra. I didn't, I didn't pronounce it right. And she's going to be talking about coconut gentrification in the coast of Ecuador. Is that where you're from? Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, my name is Pilar Eguez Guevara, and I am from Ecuador, but I've been living here for about 10 years. Um, I want to start by saying that I um, also come from a different field than many people, and the topics dealing um, most of which have been dealt in this conference. I have a PhD in anthropology, so my presentation topic is along the lines of the previous presentation about uh, not what food does to our body, but rather um, where it comes from and what, it, what happens at the places of origin of these trendy health foods. Um, I will present the findings of a, of a study I, I've been conducting uh, over the past years, um, over the past year in Ecuador, using the methods we use in anthropology, which are ethnographic fieldwork, in depth interviews, focus groups, and participant observation with older people and medical doctors, as well as literature review and commodity statistics of coconut over a period of over 50 years. So where I conducted my field work is in the province of Esmeraldas, which is um, uh, highlighted in red. Uh, it's a northern um, um, province in the west, uh, in the coast near the border with Colombia. Um, they have a population of about, about half a million people, which is predominantly of African descent. And this is a photo of the, w some of the women that I work with there. Um, so coconut is an essential ingredient in their traditional dishes um, of this region. Um, it's characteristic of this region. Um, it gives a name to the iconic um, dish from Esmeraldas called encocado which literally means coconutted. Um, a concado is a seafood or meat stew cooked in a coconut sauce and local herbs. I think I have a photo of it. Yeah. So that's a crab uh, in cocado. Um, to the tourists visiting uh, Esmeraldas beaches, uh, encocado is an exotic dish and an attraction of Ecuador's black province. As, their, um, as is uh, their traditional music and dance. However, for, uh, for black Esmeraldeños or Esmeraldans, the people from there, encocado represents more than just food. It's, just, it's a potent, potent symbol of their identity, an essential part of their bioecologic and cultural heritage and of their collective history as an ethnic and regionally distinctive people in Ecuador. Um, in spite of this um, cultural significance to the people of Esmeraldas, encocado, this dish, um, has become an exceptional as opposed to what it used to be, an everyday meal and a basic staple in the diet. In my interviews, older men and women remembered having eaten coconut in almost every single meal of their day during their childhood and um, young adult years, about 40 or 50 years ago. Um, when men, at that time, many of them still lived in the country. Um, in those years, coconut was just uh, was used to make drinks, such as um, they used to make hot chocolate with uh, fresh pressed coconut milk, smoothies made with uh, ripe plantain, cinnamon, and coconut milk, and this is known as masato. Um, this uh, upper photo there um, is what they um, they used to to drink. Not, it's not not so common anymore. Or if it's if it's done today, they used regular milk, not coconut milk. Um, children and adults used to eat pieces of coconut with rock and sugar or panela as a snack. Many desserts were made with coconut, such as the still popular cocadas made with grated coconut and rock and sugar. And that's a photo of the cocadas that are made with with white sugar, but the um, the traditional, more traditional cocadas are, are brown with raw cane sugar. Uh, <clears throat> older women from Esmeraldas told me about their um, countless soup recipes which called for coconut milk, adding a distinctive color and consistency. The encocados mentioned earlier were stews made of varieties of seafood or wild mountain animals hunted locally and cooked in a thick, flavorful coconut sauce. Even to this day, the coconut milk and cream used for cooking is fresh, hand-grated, and pressed minutes before adding it to the pot. 
Coconut oil was scantily used for frying and mostly had cosmetic and therapeutic uh, uses taken internally to combat intestinal parasites and externally as a um, skin and hair condition. Um, we do not have data for this time period, 40 or 50 years ago, but it is likely that at that time, the fat intake of Esmeraldans mostly came from oil-rich, ripe coconuts used in everyday cooking, as well as from wild-caught fish and other seafood. Older people also testified to using lard in small amounts of, for seasoning. Also, their diet unconditionally included plantains and, and, and or rice to accompany meat or fish stews, as well as small amounts of mostly cooked vegetables. And for those of you who don't know, plantains are um, a kind of banana that is not eaten raw. You have to cook it, and that's a green plantain. When it um, becomes ripe, it, it's a yellow and it's sweet. And that's the one that is used to make the smoothies that I showed before. However, Esmeralda's diets today look quite different. Compared to previous decades, today rice portions have increased significantly to make up for or replace the reduced consumption of plantains and fish, we have become, which have become more expensive and relatively inaccessible to the majority, and especially those living in urban areas. And I, I went to do my field work with a friend, and that's a, the typical dish that you, you're served today in Esmeralda. That's the kind the, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly decent amount of rice <laughs> with a little bit of, of beans and, and some fish um, on the side. That, that's actually a restaurant, uh, but generally the, the portions for, for meat are, are, or fish or, or seafood are, are smaller because they're, it's expensive and people eat a lot of rice. Um, um, so in addition, uh, fat from traditional sources like lard, fish, and coconuts has been replaced for disproportionately larger amounts of commercial vegetable oils and mar margarine made with hydrogenated ve vegetable oils. As a reference, the Food and um, Agricultural Organization reported that in 2010, 4% of the dietary intake in Ecuador came from animal fats, while over four times as much, 17% came from vegetable oils. Um, these are the um, data from the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, and they show a fourfold increase in vegetable, about a fourfold increase in vegetable oils over four decades, and relatively stable and low uh, levels of animal fat. Um, but the, most of the vegetable oil increase comes from palm and soybean oil. So Esmeraldans today are not eating um, as much, nearly as much. I'm going to go back. Um, as coconut as they used to, and certainly not every day. In fact, uh, going against the traditions and of their cultural preferences, most people in Esmeraldas are purposely avoiding coconut. Some of my interviews told me that nowadays, on average, they eat a coconut-based meal once a week or maybe twice a month. Some people, particularly medical doctors in Esmeraldas, reported eating coconut exceptionally as a treat once or twice a year, Purposely, uh, purpo repressing in purpose their desires to indulge in tempting and cocaos. So based on my, my interviews, um, I, I found that there were two main reasons for this drastic change. The first is that people, especially adults and those suffering from chronic diseases, particularly overweight and diabetes, are being medically advised to avoid eating coconut. The ongoing re preventing campaign against obesity in Esmeraldas, led, led by uh, public health authorities, prescribes not to eat fat from animal and coconut sources. And I got a flyer from a local hospital, and the um, point highlighted there is avoid saturated fats of animals and of coconut. So um, doctors in Esmeraldas and in the rest of Ecuador based these dietary pres prescriptions on the American Heart Association's current recommendations regarding saturated fat consumption and its supposed relationship with cardiovascular disease. As most of us are familiar with, these recommendations are best based on bad science, in quote, made in the 1950 United States, particularly Ansel Key's seven country studies. Nutrition books in Ecuador as late as 1960 still admitted oil from coconuts as good sources of vitamin D. 
However, already in the 70s, major vegetable oil industries were founded and processed commercial oils, particularly from palm and soybean, were advertised widely as healthy and cheap alternatives to traditional fats. By the 1980s, um, influential nutritionists in Ecuador condemned the use of lard from pigs and coconut as unhealthy sources of fat, which were harmful for the heart. The prejudice against saturated fats prevailed century today, both in the medical community as well as in popular belief. In fact, in the imagination of many, many Ecuadorians, including many people in my family, um, and many people I, I interview and I work with, margarine is a healthy food. Um, as is sunflower oil, and they're preferred over lard or coconut, which often stir feelings of guilt amongst those who choose to indulge. Therefore, it is fair to assert that thanks to the prevailing global economic and cultural hegemony, vegetable oils arrived at the tables of Ecuadorians and Esmeraldans around the 1970s, effectively displacing traditional fats from local sources via the importation of technology and bad science from the United States. The picture gets even more ugly. Um, racial prejudice against black people in Esmeraldas informs a generalized discourse among medical doctors blaming black people and their cultural traditions for their health conditions. Consider this quote from the head nutritionist at a local hospital in the city of Esmeraldas. He said to me, for generations the customs are not focused on the care of their own health, but rather the habits of the black race are not to better their health, but rather to live day by day. He said, unfortunately for the black culture, the food here in this area is hypercaloric because their main source of food is coconut. Everything is encocado. Um, there are similar expressions of food shaming with regards to plantains, which are thought to be an inferior food of, of black people or of slaves. Thus, in the, um, in the medical imagination, cultural preferences for plantains and coconut only worsen black people's supposed propensity to be fat or obese or to have hypertension, which is relatively high among black people in Ecuador. Overall, I identified a tendency among medical doctors in Esmeraldas to understand chronic diseases among black people as genetically or culturally determined. That is, individuals presumably are guilty of their bad health based on their bad habits and preferences, their culture and their inferior genetics, in quote. What is interesting about these medical understandings is that they are sharp odds with the everyday reality in Esmeraldas. According to my interviews, people in Esmeraldas, particularly those under medical oversight and treatment, avoid eating coconut under the assumption that it worsens their health conditions. Rather, they follow their medical prescription to eat vegetable oil and margarine as healthy fats. So we see how racial ideologies become entangled with obsolete medical understandings of disease, further, further amplifying the negative impacts of this epistemic uh, gap or the gap in the knowledge about health and food for black people in Esmeraldas. So the major factor um, which I uh, uh, observed uh, drives people in Esmeraldas away from coconut is an economic um, factor. Like the two other main staples, which are fish and plantains, coconuts have become scarce and expensive over time in Esmeraldas. According to my interviews, well, in the early uh, 2000s, one coconut cost as little as two, uh, 10 to 25 cents. Today, they are sold for as much as 150 or 250 dollars, uh, US dollars in terms of scarcity. But how were coconuts made scarce in the local markets of one of the major coconut producing lands of Ecuador? There are several reasons. Over the past decades, there, there were plagues that de decimated coconut palm tree plantations. And also, uh, coconut plantations have been uh, replaced by uh, other more profi profitable commodities, specifically Afri African palm uh, trees, which are used by the vegetable and soap industry. So the remaining coconuts grown in Esmeraldas are now being shipped to major cities like Quito, Guayaquil, and Cuenca to meet the growing demand for the pastry and restaurant industries that have uh, flourished there. A, a notable portion of the demand for coconuts from Esmeraldas comes from granola factories in the city of Santo Domingo, which use dr dry, grated coconut as an ingredient. More recently, government programs included granola, with graded coconuts uh, from Esmeraldas as part of school breakfast in public schools th throughout the country. 
So it's interesting to see how as, co as coconuts travel from Esmeraldas uh, to major Ecuadorian cities, they are rebranded as healthy foods. And they're predominantly consumed by white and mestizo urban middle classes um, in there. So <clears throat> I have little time. So basically, the demand of, um, there's been such great demand for coconuts in these um, urban-based industries that we've had um, to start importing coconut from Peru, Mexico, Colombia, and the Philippines, and also uh, we've started exporting coconut in the early 1990s, um, sending most of it to Spain, the United States, Colombia, and Argentina. So we all know that coconut has become so trendy here in the United States, and there's um, so much um, interest for it. Um, <clears throat> So recall my previous comment about the US-dominated economic and cultural hegemony um, that frames this field of power. And within this field of power, there are specific pathways or circuits through which health food science circulates, going from major global centers of research to global peripheries like Ecuador. Ecuadorian health authorities today are still making policy based on American Heart Association recommendations to limit consumptions of saturated fats. Um, However, there's a, this new mainstream science about the goodness of saturated fats that is gaining ground here. This new science, um, as we all know, simply validates or rediscovers long discredited and, uh, in, in the case I've presented, shamed uh, dietary traditions of uh, many populations in the tropics who have had coconut as a staple in their diet. Now this new uh, science is finding its way back to Ecuador. And I, I brought an example for you to, to see. Um, so this is a health food conscious young American and em entrepreneur that brought, brought a coconut uh, oil enterprise to the coast of Ecuador. And um, the people from the, you know, the Smithsonian Magazine that feature him say, Ecuadorian kitchens and street food stall sometimes reek of stale burnt oil, but one American man is striving to invent a new culinary tradition. And um, he is saying, it would be hard to instill coconut oil into centuries of tradition here, as if we had vegetable oil as a traditional. And uh, people are literally krilling themselves here by using tons of this rancid vegetable oil. So it's the same logic of blaming um, that, that we saw earlier. And just to wrap up, um, the, this issue of gentrification is real. There's many other foods that are uh, undergoing this, this process, and you, you might have read about quinoa. Um, but basically, um, it's when you know this foods become trendy among especially middle, middle class educated people and they are sold at high prices, they pull the prices up and then become inaccessible where they're, the, uh, the places where they're grown. Um, some implications of, uh, of this specific case um, are to, to note how these foods are framing new identities, um, modern identities of health conscious and educated US Americans who are taking in all these foods into their daily lives, but at the same time, other people are losing their resources um, um, upon which they have built their own identities for many, many years. Okay. Um, and, okay, I'll, I'll just skip. Um, are there solutions, and going back to, to the previous presentations, what can we do about it? And I'm not a big fan of, or. Not, not that I'm not a big fan, but I don't believe too much in boycott. Uh, I think that there's uh, there's a limited limited potential uh, for change through consumer choices. I think that people need to get involved, and I invite you to get involved with my project. I'm um, directing a, a project, an educational project in in Ecuador. I work with a nonprofit organization called La Poderosa Media Project, which is a film. Um, education organization, and we bring education uh, about food to Ecuador. Um, so if you are at all interested, um, I have a sign-up sheet here, and you can uh, write your email and be really happy to send you more information about how to get involved. Thanks.
Thanks, Pilar. Uh, we, ha we can do one question. Do you have any questions? Okay, let's thank Pilar again. And we're gonna try to get back on schedule, so the next talk we'll try to start around 10 o'clock still. <laughs>